Hi there, my name's Claire Williams and I work for the British Equestrian Trade Association, otherwise known as BETA. Thank you for joining us on this live as part of BETA's Summer of Safety. That's our campaign that's running from um, June through to September, covering all aspects of safety, from body protectors, hats, um, to tack, biosecurity in the yard and ending the season with feed safety. So keep an eye on what we're doing. Well, this is our first live for the series. We'll be doing other lives cover covering some of the safety equipment you're all aware of and some areas that maybe you're not so aware of. So today I'm joined by Paul Tapner. We're really pleased to have Paul join us and Dr. Di Fisher, our CMO. Paul um, will be well known to all of you, especially if you're eventing fans. He had a, a career of over 20 years as an international eventer. He won badminton in 2010, which was a fantastic achievement and represented Australia twice at the World Equestrian Games. Um, he had a pretty nasty accident last August. Um, which ended with um, two bleeds on the brain and a stroke. So Paul is joining us today to talk about the accident, his recovery and um, his attitude towards safety and his um, desire to really raise awareness of the importance of being aware of what head injuries can do and the importance of reporting them and taking time to recover. And Di is going to be my medical backup um, and just talk through some of the aspects of, of reporting head injury, concussion, how to identify it um, and how important it is when you have um, accidents to make certain they are reported. So I'm delighted to welcome Paul. Hi there, Paul. Hello. And Di. Hi, Di. Hi. Hi, guys. Hi. Good to see you, Paul. Um what are you doing now? <laughs> what am I doing now? Uh, well, I'm not riding horses anymore. It's probably the key thing to, to this broadcast. Uh, it's um, I'm very much still involved in the eventing industry and uh, involved with horses. My daughter um, is uh, very much taking up the reins on the eventing side of things. And uh, my wife is uh, very much uh, riding her dressage horses uh, to a high standard and an increasingly high standard. So, uh, and uh, obviously, we've started the, the Team Tapner Academy during lockdown, um, which was a, a, an idea to try and um, get people involved in a team situation that possibly wouldn't or, or by their own default have access to the, the benefits of the teams. Um, that uh, that some of us uh, at the elite level do uh, have, um, as well as um, Pivot Productions, which is uh, a spin-off from uh, the Event Rider Master Series, which I was heavily involved in the operations of. So um, Pivot Productions and, and uh, Team Tapner Academy, as well as uh, being a, a, a walking groom, wallet trainer and driver for, for Madison and Georgina um, is keeping me extremely busy. <laughs> yeah, it sounds like you've sort of got your comeuppance, you know, having them run around after you for so many years. Yes, you're now getting to run don't, after him. Don't you start. That's not helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't sound, tell us about your accident because it doesn't sound as though it slowed you down very much. Uh, it most definitely did slow me down. Um, and um, that's possibly the main thing in terms of, of um, the tapness. We are renowned for um, living our lives at breakneck speed and doing a huge amount um, every day. Um, and so uh, when during my rehab, um, that was one of my favorite things to say to, to the many professionals that helped me um, was say, don't ever call me normal and don't ever say I want to be normal because I'm not normal. I don't want to be normal. Um, I haven't got to where I am um, in life by being normal. You know, so I, I want to be able to get back to my um, 10, 12 and 14 hour days and not bat an eyelid at that. And I'm almost there, not quite. But um, uh, so uh, in terms of the, the workload or the, the, the work rate um, that, that the Tapners are, are renowned for, I'm, I'm getting back up to that. But that was very much, very, very hugely dented by my accident, um, which was uh, for, a, for a long period of time, which was the, the, probably the first time in my life that, not the first time, but one of the, the main times in my life that that has actually happened. And it's, it's almost, when you think about your eventing career and people think eventing is such a risk sport, it, it's sort of almost ironic that it didn't happen when you were eventing. It, it happened when you were out hacking, didn't it? 
Yeah, um, so apparently uh, I went down to the farm and got on my horse, um, uh, Bonza King of Rouge, and um, went for a, a hack around the farm. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, next thing I know, I was getting airlifted or ambulanced off to the to the local um, the hospital. Um, so various um, ideas and thoughts as to how, why, where, what, whatever, you know, and when and all that sort of thing. Um, but realistically, I don't remember, pretty much don't remember that day. Um, so I've got absolutely no, no, no idea what happened and why it happened in terms of the accident. Um, so, uh, yeah, but that is somewhat is um, a little bit um, how I dealt with um, the, the accident and, and as well as because every other time I've ever had concussion has probably been um, at an event at a cross-country course uh, or on a cross-country course whereby you have your crash um, and you, you write yourself and you sort of look around and, and think, right, do I know where I am? And it's very obvious that, you know, a jump judge comes over to you and tells you what's happened and, and you, you recognise the jump judges, you recognise the, the the jump, you probably recognise the venue, you probably recognise the horses galloped off or that was one of my favourite first questions is which horse was I riding? Um, and then you start and then for the rest of the day it's very obvious what has happened and, and so your, your memory is... Um, sometimes pieced together but very quickly reinforced in you by everybody around you and everything around you at a competition whereas in my situation i didn't have that i was in a field there was no one there so presumably i well i did come to i was never knocked out uh, cold apparently um but i looked around and i was you know found myself in a, in a crop um not with no one to enforce in reinforcing my mind what had just happened so um so that was a, a, a different experience for me in dealing with concussion um as a, as a professional rider and, and die is that pretty common is concussion a condition or is it a, a whole mix of symptoms yeah so it's it's a big spectrum so i suspect things were slightly different for you paul because we know that you did actually have a, a bleed so you had physiological proper that you know big change within your brain so concussion proper injury yeah you had a proper injury so um concussion essentially is is really sort of under it's overused as a term and it's it's tends to be our kind of it's our syndrome of something where the brain gets a really, really good shake when you knock your head. Um, and actually, interestingly, you don't actually have to hit your head to have concussion. Any big fall that can actually cause a kind of really good whiplash of your head will cause the brain to bang against part of your head. And then just because of I've got my old trusty Martha with me. But so that's the inside of um my skeleton, obviously not me, but um so if you if you whack here then it's going to whack here as well. So you get what's called a contra coup injury. Now, looking inside the top of the skull, so this is like the top part of Martha, um, it's really it's really smooth. It's okay. Yes, there's lots of veins and things that can shear and cause bleeds, but it's smooth and nice. But if you look down into the bottom of Martha's brain, it's, re oh, it's really yeah. spiky and sharp. So these actually hurt if you press on them. So you've got your brain sitting within that, it gets a really good shake. So if we CT'd or MRI'd somebody that didn't have an actual physical bleed that was uh, that uh, uh, that is there, we wouldn't see anything. It would look normal. But you could have somebody that literally couldn't stand up, is vomiting, her headache from hell, you know, and has got real signs of head injury. And that's because if you think of the brain, it's made up of neurons with the long axons. So they look almost like a tadpole, almost like with the long tails. And they're all really packed in closely together when you think of what a brain looks like. And um, they get stretched, they get torn. And those gaps between those cells become leaky. And when they leak, they leak out all the electrolytes and bits and pieces that make those nerves fire. And then because they've leaked, that then affects their neighboring cell and then their neighboring cell leaks. So you get the brain that's in this really incredibly vulnerable state that is just sort of sat there needing loads and loads of oxygen 
because it's working really hard because of the concussion. But all this leaky stuff around it is meaning that there's not as much blood coming into it. So you just end up with this horrible, vicious cycle of an incredibly, incredibly vulnerable brain. And it, it is a spectrum. You know, you can have somebody who is a bit concussed and for a, a, you know, a couple of hours, a couple of days, things are a bit off. They're a bit more tired, a bit grouchy, you know, maybe felt a bit sick if they ate a big meal, right down to somebody that two years down the line still can't walk in a straight line. Although you could still CT them and see nothing there. And, and so it so is a spectrum, but commonly a couple of weeks. Kids are a bit more, kids are a bit different. So we always warn any parents with a child with a decent head injury that doesn't need scanning and no signs of bleed, expect behavior change for up to three months. So grouchy, sleeping more than normal, flying off the handle, personality change, you know, all those parts of it, we were warned for up to three months and no contact sport. And so you know, Paul's lost a large chunk of his memory. Is yeah. that typical? Will that always happen when you have a head injury? Yeah, it can do. Yeah, it does normally. Ha it normally happens. And it's an indication for us. So it's one of the questions that we will ask you when you come to hospital. Can you remember your day before like so what happened to you leading up like can you like for you could you remember tacking up your horse can you remember actually going out for the ride or is it the day before because all of these are indications of severity of injury and then there's kind of like do you remember hitting the floor because if you didn't remember hitting the floor then you probably were knocked out you're just not aware of it and then do what's the first thing you do remember which is quite sometimes i'll see somebody in the trauma bay and they'll be like well talking to you now and then i'll see them in itu or on the ward a couple of days later, a couple of weeks later, and ask them what the first thing is they remember. Now, it might be the fact that they had chips on Friday last week, and they don't remember any of that at all, because the brain's just not able to function. It's struggling to keep itself alive. So it's doing everything it can to protect itself. And yeah, memory, memory is common to go. And for us, as an assessment tool, it's really handy to know. And for me, that's one of my biggest nightmares as an accident like Paul, because he had nobody with him so he's got nobody that could say to me well you know i mean it will have been obvious with paul that he needed a ct scan and he had a significant brain injury but it's those patients that are just a bit in between whereas if you can get a really good history about how it happened so was it the fall that caused this or did something happen that caused them to fall so that's one of the first questions. And then on top of that, there is what were they like afterwards? Did they make sense? Were they looking, were their eyes going in the, in the right direction? You know, were their arms and legs moving properly? Were they coordinated? Did they make sense? That information is crucial. And that's what we very rarely get. I, I you know, talking about the person that, that discovered me, and this is Digger Dog, who's just oh, yeah. Yeah. Digger. Digger, come on, Digger. We can see Digger. Yeah, where are you? Clever dog. Did he give the alert? Yes, so this is Digger Dog who gave the oh, alert. Clever boy. Yes, he's very clever, right? He's very noisy now. Go away. <laughs> go on, go on. <laughs> it's a tail. I love it's the Very the old as well. Go, go on, go on. It's, it's interesting what you said, Paul, about having all those falls of venting, because that's the thing. It's, you know, you were a professional rider, but you just kept going. Yeah, exactly. So, um, yeah, you know, it's very interesting to listen to Diane about that, um, all of those different things. And and I, the thing I I found fascinating in what you're saying there, and, and as well as being a parent and a, and and instructor, is that the um, it would take longer for kids. Um, I, I don't yeah. uh, hear that right in terms of their mood swings or their differentiation. Yeah, of it's their... a kind of it's a warning. It's it's a, it's a warning to the parents that we always give, and particularly with the contact contact sports as well for them we we advise three months which when you think about it when we all fell off when we were kids it was get straight back on and i'm not, not saying not the three seconds that we're used to <laughs> yeah but and i'm not saying that every child that falls off needs to then not do anything for three months at all it's when they've had a significant knock to their head and and there is a diagnosis of concussion at that point then you need to avoid contact sport and a lot of that comes from there was a lot of work done with the NFL and there is a syndrome that has been reported. It isn't common. It's very, very rare, but it's still there called um, a second in impact syndrome where they found that um, if you were in this sort of very vulnerable brain state and you had a second impact, 
that you could get sort of swelling in your brain that would force your brain through this hole and kill you immediately within about th two and a half minutes, three minutes of the impact. So there is a significant reason why we say you must not ride again. And I know for BE, it's six weeks, isn't it? But for us, we at the hospital, we advise three months. So it's just, yeah, you, you, I mean, you might not knock your head again, might you? But it's just, it's what we advise and then what obviously we advise the six weeks. But I'm glad they do that. Like, that's good that they do that. Yeah, and um, certainly the, the number of times that uh, I've, I've hit my head um, and had varying degrees of concussion, but certainly been concussed um, and uh, either ignored it and carried on or, um, you know, not told anybody about it and, and carried on as per normal, be that during that that instant or that day or that week or that month or whatever, um, I've lost count how many times I've, I've, as a professional rider, done that, and I'm not endorsing that and shame that anybody should do that. But the the research that has gone on, and you mentioned AFL, and there's uh, you know countless contact sports, even non-contact sports that we consider non-contact sports, so soccer. There's a huge amount of investigation into the, yeah. the heading and what that does to the brain. So it is a, a huge amount of evidence to say that repetitive, um, you know bashes to the head and in the, even if they don't cause any concussion at that point in time um they do have an effect like we say it is rico ricocheting your brain around it is having a cumulative effect on you um which will have a negative impact on you at some stage whether that is right there and then or whether that is um years to come or or, or anything of the kind um but uh certainly from, from my point of view um i mean i've always been an advocate i say always um the vast majority of my riding career i've been an advocate of of crash hats and i never i never get on a horse without a crash hat and my mm -hmm. staff and my kids or anybody in my at my yard will never be allowed to get on a horse mm -hmm. um, without a crash hat um and um you know quite hot on that and that was um, it's interesting listening to you there, Di, specifically because of an incident that happened um, in my um, in the 1990s in my um, uh, first starting out as a as a rider, um, whereby I started out at a riding school. Uh, we had to ride in a riding helmet, went to pony club, you had to wear a helmet. But then when I started to have my horses at home, I started to think, oh, do I need to ride in a helmet all the time? I don't really know that I need to, you know. So I started to have that discussion with myself as to whether I needed to or not. But at that same sort of time, as a, as a young adult, um, a, 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 a guy, a, a pro rider called Guy Wallace, who's a, a, um, a colleague of mine, um, uh, had a, 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 an injury um a significant uh, fall at a competition um, and bashed his head quite hard. Um, and um, that was the last competition of that season. He then went on to train his horses at home. He was having headaches, didn't really tell any too many people about it, never got any real medical attention because it, it, at that stage it, it probably wasn't uh, normal anyway, uh, or at least understood by the medical profession. Um, and then, however, I think it was 10 days or however long later, he's found at home in a field um, completely out of it. Um, he'd been riding a very, very quiet horse. He'd been riding without a hat because he always rode without a hat at home. Um, and um, But he was um, basically, in a, from then on in, he's, he's, he's been in a vegetative state. You know, he's been in a very, very severely disabled, mentally disabled state. Mm -hmm. um, and he's the same age as me, he's still alive and, and, and you know, a terrible situation for him to be in being one of the the up-and-coming um uh, australian event riders was going to be the next gold medalist and and all of a sudden he's um you know in an extremely disabled state now um and that was to my mind that made it clear to me that you need yeah. to ride in a helmet no matter what because he yeah. was at home he was in a field there was it was on a quiet horse he was you know there was no reason for him to fall off you know mm. he probably blacked out from his complications from yeah. his mental injury mm. but then hit the ground and hit and hit his head a second time and yeah. you know you've already said you can hit your head a second time and that's going to cause an, an awful yeah. lot of problems so cause him a huge amount of problems and i was like you know what you don't actually know when you're going to fall off you don't know when you're going to hit yeah. your head so just ride in a hat the whole time so you know that's that's been my policy ever since i've i've always ridden in a hat and anybody who's around me will always ride in a hat 
But that's so reassuring as well, because obviously, you know, through the whole of your career, you've been a very inspirational rider. And it does make a difference if the top riders are wearing their, you know, wearing their hats and having a policy on their own yards that actually, you know, it's non-negotiable. And, you know, even if you're just going to pop and do this, you, you need your hat on. Like, you know, yeah. that, that's that's ideal. My other little pet bugbear and hate is when I see people do their show jumping round, for example, and then unclip their hat. Yeah. Yeah. And they just undo the harness. And at most of the pictures that you see of somebody that's just finished their round and they've done really well, the harness is hanging down. And you're just like, guys, like, just take the bloody thing off then. Like, don't wear one then. Like, but don't unclip it. Like, either wear it or don't, like, don't not wear it. But it drives me insane. You see these beautiful pictures that I don't know, all sorts of brands and everything are using and the straps hanging. Because it's like, I've jumped, I've finished, I'm clear, unclip. It's like, no, do it quick up. <laughs> that's <laughs> insane. Well, that's, you, the time. that's the time you bloody get done is when your buckle ends, you're not expecting it, you're not riding defensively, something comes from nowhere, that's when it happens. Yes. Mind you, I saw a picture, what was it on yesterday? Was it on Facebook or was it in Horse and Hound? And it was a prize giving at an event. I think it was last weekend's event and it was from the show jumping and the guy had a hat on and honestly, I could have stuck a fist through the harness. I just, you know, you could yeah. see clear air. I thought, for Christ's sake, you could slip it off without undoing the strap. Uh -huh. Were you, just out of curiosity, were you wearing a skull, Paul? Did, would you hack out in a skull or a riding yeah. hat? Yeah. 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 Uh, I can't remember which hat I was wearing. It was sent off to um, Gatehouse, so I've ridden in yeah. Gatehouse hats for a very long time. Yeah. Um, I believe them to be the the, the best quality hat that that um, I for for my purpose. Um, uh, so um, I was wearing a gatehouse hat. It was sent back to them for them to an, uh, analyze as to what went what happened. Um, it obviously said the same as what the um, medical profession said that I'd had a hit to the the back left side of my my head mm -hmm. just there. And, uh, um, uh, it was it was quite obvious that that's where the impact, uh, the main impact, had been. Um, but it the, the had it done its job because um, if if it hadn't taken the impact, then quite possibly my skull would be broken or open or injured more severe than I, than it was. So um, I, I think that honestly, with um, from what you're saying, what injuries you did have with a very high standard, well fitted hat, you know, you, there's a real possibility you wouldn't be here to discuss it. Like so, you know, your yep. hat has definitely done the job. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, and what, what uh, like post accident when you got home? What did they actually advise you? Did they t tell you to you know what were their instructions in terms of your recovery? Because you never get on a bloody horse. Never get on yeah, a horse. Never get on a horse. Dangerous things. Do you, you actually expect me to remember that? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I had a head injury, man. <laughs> a head injury and a stroke. So uh, yeah, no, my my memory is is. Um, it's a good five weeks uh, minimum that I do not have any recollection of whatsoever um, from the day of the accident, um, post-accident. And then anything from there is um, I liken to being drunk. Um, it's very, very hazy. You know, when you have a, a, a drunken night out, you might remember some bit, some parts really clearly. Some people remember everything. Some people remember nothing. There's parts I remember clearly there's parts I have no memory of whatsoever there's parts I have a fuzzy memory of um and the main thing that still affects me in that respect is the my um uh, comprehension if that's the right word of timelines so everything just feels like last month or last week or whatever so it, you know it might have been six months ago and I, I it just still feels like last week or it might have been last week and it feels the same as the six the thing that happened six months ago so my timeline um is a little bit messed up but thankfully my my memory has has returned and, and i haven't had any um uh effects of my long-term memory i still know how to do my job i still know how to, to teach people to ride horses i still know how to um you know set up cameras at tv productions and uh, all this sort of thing so my my um my my long term memory has not been affected, and my my short term memory has only been affected by the the timeline issue. But um, there's lots of different ways you can um, I can cope with that. So 
I am very lucky in respect to the, the severity of my injury um, that I have been able to um, rehabilitate myself in a huge um, a huge fashion and rapidly. But again, that's partly because of my mindset um, that I've already said that mm. I live life um, very fast and I want everything to happen yesterday. I'm very impatient and um, uh, I, I'm not afraid to just continue on and keep doing things. Um, but uh, the same sort of thing as what happened with Tapner, um, Team Tapner Eventing, we used to always employ all the different professionals, you know, and you'd make sure that you had the best physiotherapist, you'd have the best farrier, you'd have the best vet, you'd have the best psychologist, you'd have the best, you know, absolutely not the everything. We would make sure we had the best expert in. Well, then this was the same for my rehabilitation here is that not only did it start with the best house, uh, sorry, the best hats in gatehouse, but I had, um, uh, an awful lot of um, professional uh, medical help in terms of physiotherapists, in terms of um, psychologists, um, uh, speech therapists, um, you name it, all of these different um, professional people that helped me um, rehabilitate myself uh, and all of the things I was experiencing and still to this day um, experience. And I, I know you hate the, no I know you hate the word normal, but how, how do you feel where you are now? Are you your normal or have you still got a way to go? Uh, no, I'll never be my normal again because I, I, I have no desire to ride a horse again. Um, and that mm. is basically because um, I worked with uh, Oaksy House who are very much um, centred around the jockey rehabilitation yeah. because the jockeys have lots of crashes, obviously. Um, and um, they put me on a plastic horse uh, one of their plastic horse exercises. Uh, I did that twice, um, which was then they demanded that I do that because it was either that or get on one of my riding school cobs, which didn't excite me very much. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I got on the plastic horse in a private room and nobody could see me. And I thought, right, um, and did what they told me to do. Um, and I was like, if I have to concentrate this much to control my left side and to yeah do rising trot and to just stay on a plastic horse which has not got a mind of its own yeah. um, if i if, if i have to concentrate this much just to do what i would consider extremely basic things and not mm -hmm. get back up to the same level of and standard of, of competition riding that i was at before mm -hmm. I, the desire is not there i have no desire to do that so um i am a, a stroke victim i am a continuing stroke mm -hmm. victim I, I very very mild in terms of most people have had strokes i'm not going to compare myself it's not a competition but um i do take an enormous amount of energy and effort to control my left leg and my left side mm -hmm. and control my balance and my um speech so my speech therapist was the second last person to discharge me from their um mm -hmm their work their work their yeah, their, you know, uh, <laughs> whatever the correct yeah. speech is <laughs> but I, um, I think that that's incredibly key and and i think that's that reflects mm -hmm. i think your strength of character as well that mm -hmm. you acknowledge that you don't want to ride i think a lot of riders when they have an accident feel they have to continue for some reason mm -hmm. even though it might not be what's best for them uh, we've just had a question which is interesting katie asks is the memory loss helpful in removing the fear for some people of perhaps getting back on die that might be one for you is is that ever um well, I guess, well, yeah, I guess it, I mean, I guess it could be, but I think a lot of people that have had a significant injury, th there's so many things with concussion that can go on for a period of time. So certainly the, the balance is an issue um, and anything that involves nerves or proprioception. So that, so your balance, as soon as you get back onto a horse, it's like, you know, it's that whole thing, oh, you can get on and ride a bike again, but it's that whole wobbling period that, could be that's actually what you're going to be like and there's no 100 percent when that bit will end so you can you can rehabilitate and have all the physio and everything else but certainly um for paul it's, it's different because it's not just a head injury this is recovering from a stroke as well so that degree of sort of bike wobble getting back on could could it could be indefinite so you you just along that that sort of um along that spectrum but I guess I mean I guess it works with babies doesn't it you're supposed to forget the pain of babies and then you go on and have another one and then go Jesus Christ this is why I forgot because I would never have done this again 
Um, but yeah, I suppose it would. But I, I tend to find that people that contact me and um, people that have had serious sort of accidents that it's to me, it's always down to mindset. And, and it's down to the mindset of an individual with major trauma makes the, it's the difference to me a lot of the time between somebody living and dying. And it's about that, having that fight in somebody. And if you've got that, if you've got injuries that it doesn't matter how much their mindset's there, the fight, they're not going to be able to beat it. That happens. But certainly with people where you're going to predict where they go in their recovery, you can predict that from how they're how they are. And certainly somebody that's very driven, very focused, is not going to give up, is going to be very dogged in their rehabilitation, is going to just do it every bit of it. And when they've done it, they're going to do 10 more. You know, I can move my arm like that, but you know what? I can do 20. And when you've gone, I'm going to do another 10. Those are the people that will really, really push through. Yeah, that's exactly what I did after mine. So, you know, those are the people that will push through. The ones that get told off because you weren't supposed to go and do that yet, but they've already actually done it. I'm not obviously not advocating do what your physio, (laughs) more than your physio says, but it's uh, it's somebody that has been, you know, a top, Eventer is not gonna, you know, they're gonna rehab strong strongly. If if they're able to, they will be the ones that will rehab strongly. Can, so, can I jump in there? Logic says that if if you're um, struggling to to get back in for to the riding of some description because you've you've had a, a, an accident, um, the logic the first logical thing is you you should be um, seeking the help of some sort of psychologist or sports psychologist you know it doesn't mean just because you're going to go to a psychologist that there's something wrong with you and you're admitting defeat and all that sort of thing i mean i've been amazed at how um you know in my career um it was very normal for me to see a sports psychologist and use a sport psychologist and 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 um have, have sports psychology um, it was just that was seemed to be normal. It's whereas um, a lot of people still see that as you know. I mentioned sports psychology, and they think it's this black art. It's like no, that's how you kind of get places and do things. So um, it, yes, logic says if you can't remember the accident, um, yeah, it, you, you can't you can't have any fear of it. Can you happening again? Um, and I understand that what your um, listener was saying is that you know. If you're coming to a big ditch fence and you've fallen in a ditch before, well, then clearly the next time you ride to a ditch fence, you're going to be slightly concerned. There's something wrong with you if you're not. Mm-hmm. But um, there's uh, psychology and or riding techniques to to make yourself uh, get over that rather than bashing your head around and not remembering. Mm. <laughs> and there's two parts. I to remember. <laughs> there's the parts that have, like, obviously your brain, like, we only use, it's something like 10%, don't we? There's only about 10% that we're aware of what it does. And we have, obviously, the difference between our, our conscious and our subconscious and our unconscious as well. And there's so much going on in the background. And we've certainly got a very primitive brain underneath there with this um funny bit called the um amygdala which is the you know if you suddenly like jump away from something but you didn't see it coming you know so your brain's you know brain is a very primitive organ that will do everything it can to make sure that you do not die like that's what it's there for so even if you don't remember that doesn't mean your brain's forgotten so you may find that you know you've got uh, what appears to be an irrational fear it's not irrational at all I mean, and certainly if you've had a nasty accident riding a horse, why and you've hurt your brain's hurt itself, why is your brain gonna go, oh yeah, go and do that again? Fear is not irrational. It's it's just you know it's it's preservation, yeah. A few years ago, you know, in case there was a Tyrannosaurus Rex around. It's what it's why the zebra, you know, legs it just for no reason, you know, it's it's a survival. Yeah, I mean I I I got kicked in the face by one of my girls while I was picking out a back hoof. Yeah, not good. Ripped a lot of my face. It wasn't it wasn't pretty and it wasn't pleasant. But I picked her back up, foot up to pick it up again. But I tell you what, it took me a while to trust myself to do it because my brain was screaming at me, don't. Don't. I, I can scream at you, don't do it as well. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. Katie so cool. says, I'll tell you. <laughs> psychology fascinates me and 100% agree it's underused and undervalued. Do you recommend patients see psychologists so, longer so, term post accident? Yeah, so with all the major trauma um, patients that come through my hospital, if they qualify as major trauma, um, regardless of mechanism or whatever, 
we have a team that look after and I'm sure it was very similar for Paul there's a team um, and psychology are pr probably normally the last to go and tend to be in contact with our patients for up to five ten years afterwards including the family because it's really stressful for the family as well because not only have they got this sudden bombshell of what's happened it's all about coping with the change in the person as well you know it's it's a massive impact on not not just the person with the accident so yes we do and they they i mean they most of them stay around for about five five six seven years i remember seeing an interview with you on horse and country tv paul with you and george georgina and how stressful it was for her um, it was fine for me because I don't remember anything. You don't remember anything. <laughs> Is it no any impact on like her riding or on your daughter riding? Has it made them act differently? Um, I mean, I've had a fairly um, unique uh, perspective on safety and um, personal safety when it comes to sport and my sport throughout my whole career. And I'm not afraid to say that to other people, no matter how young they are in that um and so obviously my my wife um has been exposed to that for a great number of years because we married a, a number of years as well as then we are keen to expose that to our um our daughter who is is also riding um and the the, the key with that is is that you know you don't you're under no pressure to do anything and you're only doing it because you accept it and whatever level of safety um is um uh, safety and I say whatever level of safety there's so many different perspectives there whatever level of safety is is applicable to the individual so it's whatever Madison as my daughter was whatever she decides is um, acceptable to her in terms of risk and in terms of safety then that's fine that's that's her decision um, but obviously you you make those decisions based around in information at the time so mm -hmm like what we've just been discussing now, as well as then the um, technology at the time. So all of the different um, safety stirrups and or hats and or air vests and or body protectors and or, you know, million and one different things that there might be for um, safety. Um, you know, you, you you say what is acceptable to you or, and and either do that or, or get out. And, and I've, I've uh, always, said that needs to happen right from the word go. Now, so no matter how young the rider is, they should be exposed to that and they should be, you know, if you're 10 years old, then you are responsible for your own safety. Don't do anything stupid. Don't wear anything that you shouldn't wear. Um, it's not your parents' responsibility. It's your responsibility. Yeah. Um, so that's, you know, in, in terms of influencing Madison, that's an ongoing um, discussion, not only from all the many injuries that I've had over the years and the, obviously this most recent um, uh, one, which is a significant one, but also um, any of the uh, the young people that are injured and or um, unfortunately lose their lives in, in our sport, um, you know, all has an impact on us and all should make us think about um, being safe or being risky or whatever level of of those things is acceptable for each individual yeah just out of curiosity Bria asks did when 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 they were looking for you did you have anything on you that helped them find you yeah so um actually in, in that respect my family is very much into their technology uh, particularly my son and myself. So I had my phone on me and it's always been a policy of Tapner eventing team to always, um, whenever anybody, so we live on a 500 acre farm and as well as it's got uh, riding around all 500 acres, as well as then um, on-road riding, as well as neighbors farms, you know, you can you can ride for many hours um, out from our, our yard. So it's always been our policy um, that whenever a staff member or one of our people leaves um, on a horse that they have a mobile phone with them um, so that, you know, if they fall off, they can call in and say I've fallen off or whatever. Um, you know, we have a, a two roads going through our farm, so it's it's important in that respect. It's, it's a safety feature that we've always had. So I, I did have my phone on me. Um, I was, in fact, in no state to use it, um, whether that was because I was unconscious or because I was off in La La Land, which clearly I was. Um, and um, but my um, the horse 
made its way back to the stables, as did my dog. Um, and um, uh, so Digger, who you know, anybody that was at the start of this broadcast saw Digger um, st sticking his, his, his mutt in, um, he and the horse made it back to the gateway, one of the gateways on the farm or the, the gateway which stops them going onto the road. And he then proceeded to make an enormous amount of noise, um, which then alerted people in the yard as to what's that noise about? Why is the dog, why is Digger barking? That's not normal. Um, so um, they then discovered that the horse and Digger were back at the gate without me, um, uh, which then, you know, a bit of a panic as to find me because uh, normally I would ring in in such a situation and say, horses on its way back without me mm -hmm. um uh but i hadn't done so they my son actually um had to use find my iphone which my whole family's on um and he used find my iphone to find me um and drive mm -hmm. around and, and find me um and then um so uh, you know obviously a huge advocate of of that being uh, mm -hmm. applicable to anybody and everybody um it, obviously if you don't have an iphone then there's there's other apps available um, but the other thing that the, the uh, ambulance service then used, um, which we hadn't used, but they used it to, to guide in the air ambulance, um, was uh, What Three Words. Yes, yeah. um, so the What Three Words app was just used by them and it was um, apparently, so I'm told, um, quite amazing as to how accurate they could be because obviously we're the 500 acre farm and, uh, and my son found me crawling around in a crop. Um, <laughs> him describing to the ambulance how to get to me was difficult mm. because he needs to tell them which gateway to come in, which track to follow, you know, drive mm. this way, don't drive that way. And, and so for him to guide the ambulance to him was actually quite difficult. Uh, he, he very um, expertly did that. But actually, if he had the What Three Words app, he could have just given them that and they would have figured out how to get there, them, get to me themselves, as they did do then to the air ambulance. So, um, so they're the two um, the, the two apps and that we that we are advocating from our experience. Um, and um, certainly, uh, everybody should have a mobile phone these days. Um, it's highly unlikely that they don't. And like I said, already said, it was long been our policy that everybody, when they're riding out, um, they have their mobile phone with them. So, yeah, that's, that's really key. What three words? We've got a section of the Summer of Safety later on where we talk about that and we work with the Royal Air Ambulance as well. And the other thing that I've got, I came off a couple of weeks ago, landed hard, um, didn't have concussion, I think, And um, but I've got an Apple Watch and and it's got a an app on it um, where if I land and bang hard, it bings me and says, have I fallen off? And if I don't answer it within a minute, it actually then calls the emergency services for me, which I think is brilliant. It does make you get up pretty quickly because you want to turn it off. <laughs> I don't want to call the emergency. Oh, no, 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 you got to turn it off. It's not um, a lot different from me being at a competition and jumping back up and saying, I'm fine, I'm not injured, where am I? Yeah. But it's really, I mean, that's another, you know, let's use technology. I agree with you. I never used to ride with a mobile phone and now I don't go anywhere without one. It's key. And it's interesting what you say about um, psychology and, and mental health. Somebody's asked that as well. Do you think it's something that really we should look at for the amateur side as well? Is it too focused on the elite? Do you, do you ever touch on this at the Pony Club? All of the time. Every lesson I gave a Pony Club rally uh, a couple of days ago and I was like, right, what's the first most basic sports psychology technique? And that was just literally to, to, to sh explain to them how to learn a show jumping course. Oh, brilliant. I mean, you can be at 80 centimetres and know that. And that's, you know, if you don't even know what your first basic sports psychology technique is to remember a course, then, you know, yeah. yes, it, it, absolutely, utterly anybody and everybody can can benefit from um, sports psychology. If you are you if you are partaking in a sport, guess what? This is a sport. Um, then uh, it doesn't matter what level you are, you can still employ sports psychology techniques. Yeah. Um, it, it's interesting in terms of what we're discussing now. For me, um, obviously, I've uh, had influence from a huge number of different sports psychologists over the years. Um, but I then, through my injury, had to work with um, neuropsychologists and or trauma psychologists and or different things. And um, it amazed me that none of them know what the other one does because they're to we all call them psychologists and things that should be all the same thing. But they were like, <laughs> sports psychologist has no idea what a neuropsychologist covers or does or techniques. And a neuropsychologist is totally different from, you know, they're, they're all these, these different 
areas within psychology which um they are totally totally different in what they do um so i thought that was very fascinating from my point of view i was just like well surely you know what a sports psychologist no, is. that would be seen as a little bit of hocus pocus witchcraft pokery, <laughs> pokery, stuff that happens not within the nhs that's why but there is like it's like everything isn't it it's like you know an orthopedic surgeon's not very keen on a chiropractor normally and you know there's just a bit of you know yeah it's a little bit of professional stuff that goes on at times <laughs> We can't say professional jealousy, but professional. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. <laughs> so, the, the, sort of drawing this to, to almost a close, because we've been going three quarters of an hour. Um, what's your key, Paul, if you were advising young riders uh, regarding safety, what would be your key messages? Uh, my key message is is embrace technology, um, and that is mm -hmm. at, in every single aspect. So um, I wear an air jacket, and you know, use air jackets. And air jackets are going to develop, um, and then you know, what we have now is going to be chalk and cheese to what's available in x number of years time. Mm -hmm. um, and the same with um, safety stirrups. You know. Um, buy safety syrups, use safety syrups. And I mean, that was highlighted by Harry Mead's terrible accident um, end of last year. So, um, and I know that the, you know, safety syrups in terms of the, the, the quantity of sales has boomed since his accident. So, um, you know, I'm sure there is a, a huge quantity of different um, safety syrups out there, some more effective than others, but, um, you know, figure out which is the best one for your purpose and yourself and use it. And the same with the, with the crash hats, you know, figure out which is this, the best one for your head uh, or fits your head perfectly or best um, and buy it, use it. And, and do actually do what it says and throw it away after every crash you have or every time you drop it or whatever because you know it, they uh all of those things um that work and help you whether it's an iphone what three words whether it's a you know uh, a, a different type of jump a, a safety steer a safety cup you know it <laughs> doesn't yeah. matter any yeah. sort of equipment and technology that, that makes uh, the sport of equestrianism um, safer, then use it, embrace it, and go for it. Yeah, and I suppose it's, it's pretty much taking responsibility. You know, we do it because it's a risk sport. Some people do it because it's a risk sport, but you've got to mitigate the risks and make it as safe as you can within that activity. Yeah, exactly. So if you decided to... Um, to take the risks, that's fine. You take the risk, but do it with as much safety support or, or equipment or technology around you whilst taking the risks that you, are acceptable to yourself. Yeah. And, and Di, what would you, your key message about safety or accidents be? I, th I think with that, I think I'd second like what both of you have said. And I think if you're going to have a major trauma, it you know, that it's going to happen. If it happens, it happens. But it's very difficult to get for somebody when they, for example, have got on the horse for the only time ever without a hat, who is then, you know, in a real serious situation. And, and I think just get rid of the if only. So, you know, if there is safety equipment there, it's it's fine. Like, you know, just, just wear it and, and be responsible for ourselves. And then I guess my other thing that I would say is just be it's not you don't need to present you know two weeks later with a hemoneumothorax you know I, I have this all the time where somebody's you know this whole attitude of I can't I don't need checking I'm absolutely fine sometimes you actually do and and that's okay and it doesn't make you any less of a rider or any less of a person um, and actually to get the best outcome for your injuries, we need to see you as soon as possible. That doesn't mean I want to see everybody if there's nothing wrong with them. But um, yeah, just be aware of the, the worries that there can be with the head injuries and concussions we've talked about before. And I think you're going to pop it on afterwards, aren't you? The FEI have put out a really good concussion tool with the kind of red, if this, you know, something's happened, laminate it, chuck it on your tack room wall. Are they doing X, Y, or Z? Fine, phone an ambulance. Are they doing A, B, and C? You know, phone this person. You know, it's a really good tool. So just be more aware, I think, and be able to describe your injuries because you're speaking a different language to the doctors. Now, we speak a different language to everybody anyway. 
But on top of that, they really don't get equestrianism. They might watch football on a Saturday. They quite like cricket, most people, or rugby. They haven't got a bloody clue about horses. And you will come in and go, oh, I had a bit of a fall. You didn't have a bit of a fall. You were about 18 foot in the air going at 20 miles per hour and then were ejected from a horse at speed and then landed on essentially concrete. You know, this is the mechanism of injury that we get in a motorbike where we call a trauma call before you even hit the hospital, yet the equestrians stuck in the waiting room, hanging out of a wheelchair because they've said, oh, just have a yeah, bit of a fall, yeah, they made me come, I'm fine. And actually, they've got more bloody injuries than the motorcyclists. So yeah. learn how to describe you, how you did it so that we understand. Um, and yeah, then I'll we're, we're with that. yeah, we all play it down. Yeah, you, you do. You had a bit of a fall. Yeah, there's yeah. no bit of a fall. It's like, and you can have a bit of a fall and you're fine. And that's, you know, that's grand. But understanding yeah. the difference yeah so we are going to put it's a it's a it's a download really easy that you can laminate lots of colors which which is dicey it sort of says the key things to look out for and the key things to report so we'll put that as a download and then also um, keep an eye on the website because we're launching our survey today which includes questions on concussion just to understand a bit more of how often it happens and what the results are and also a bit about safety stirrups because as Paul says you know safety stirrups there are a lot out there but we're just a bit concerned that safety is becoming more of a marketing tool than actually meaning it really means yeah. safety. And so um, we're just doing some work on actually what is a safety stirrup and what does that mean and is it really safe? So your input on that will be really appreciated. So thank you both hugely, Paul. It's been so good to hear your experiences and really get that message of safety across. Really appreciate it. And I thank you again. I think pleasure. it's really important to have both angles on this. So um, thank you both. Have a great day and um, hope to see you again. No problem. Thank you very much. No Thanks, guys. Thanks very much.